Languedoc Roussillon region of France is one of the most evocative destinations in the world, and for me, it was love at first sight. I now call the beautiful medieval town of Uzès my home for many months of the year. What better way to share it than with a week-long movable feast? I call those who join me on my guided culinary adventures my gastronomers. And the south of France is a land of incredible flavors and atmosphere. So come with me. I'm Peter Mathias, and this is my culinary adventure in the south of France. The Languedoc's main center is Montpellier, a two-hour drive from my base in Uzès and just half an hour from the coast. It's a beautiful city and comparatively young, being one of the very few cities in France without a Roman history. I adore visiting this lovely city. It's like a petite version of Paris, with its grand Place de la Comédie, its meandering medieval streets, and its Arc de Triomphe. Montpellier is a very beautiful old university city, full of lovely gardens, all the old quartiers, but also juxtaposed with super modern architecture. The cuisine is Mediterranean, of course, flooded with sunshine and emotionality and creativity. In fact, it's just like the people here who are open-hearted and saucy. And whenever you say to someone, I'm going to Montpellier, they always smile and say, Ah, Montpellier. In this episode, I meet some of Montpellier's modern-day artisans, including Michelin chef Laurent Tourcel and a luthier or violin maker. I explore one of the city's historic follies, chateau still breathing with the life of a 10th generation yeah. noble family. Yeah. Okay. And my gastronomads enjoy a field trip in the Uzes countryside to learn about goat cheese and how to prepare a good old-fashioned peasant feast. Montpellier is that it's packed with young people and there's lots of racial diversity. As a trading centre, it's historically fostered a tradition of tolerance. I could spend rather a lot of time enjoying the shopping down these alleyways. Bonjour, Monsieur Pinto. Now this is the most Fantastic um, delicatessen, I guess you would call it, um, luxury goods food store. This is what's fantastic. Monsieur Pinto does these wonderful spice mixes, but they're in little packets and they're always fresh. And when you take them home, because he sells so much, and when you take them home and you open them up, it just reminds you of this shop. It's so magical. <laughs> uh, he wants me to get uh, smell a vision so that, that you can smell his spices, how fresh they are. Qu'est-ce que j'achèterai comme mélange? La garriguette. La garriguette. Oui, vous m'avez donné ça. Voilà. It's a magic mix that goes with everything. I think I'm going to invent some kind of recipe involving lamb and garrig herbs and maybe even a bit of goat cheese. I just can't help myself. My lodging in Montpellier is Le Jardin des Sons. The hotel's reserved exterior conceals the sophistication within. The elegant dining room, the canvas for the evening's artistry. This two-star Michelin restaurant is headed by the Port Sal brothers, identical twins Laurent and Jack. This is Laurent, a self-described homebody. Jack is frequently abroad, running the duo's chain of fine restaurants around the world, in Japan, China, Thailand, Morocco, and Algeria. Le Jardin des Sons is the flagship, and Laurent runs it with the calm and focus of a submarine captain. Yeah, I hate being in professional kitchens because it gives me too many bad memories. But this is an ocean of zen in here, and they've got one of the best 
we call a piano in uh, kitchen parlance, the best ovens in the world, which is a bonnet. It's the most divine thing. It's a work of art all on its own because it's, it's brass. It's um, absolutely beautiful to look at and fantastically reliable to work with. Not very many kitchens have this oven. Un tout petit peu. Euh... Sur l'Asie, avec oui. quelques influences un petit peu qui, peut, qui peuvent arriver sur certains plats, certaines touches. Mmh. Et, et voilà, donc après, notre cuisine, elle est très, elle est très d'aujourd'hui, elle est très contemporaine. Quoi. Mais elle n'est pas moléculaire. So I won't expect a chemistry lesson when I join a class at the Jardin des Sciences Culinary School in the morning. This dégustation, compliment to the chef, is a real education. Clean, clear flavors and very exciting to the palate. I want to learn from this guy. What a treat, a top-notch hotel and a cooking lesson. I'm told that Le Jardin des Sciences cooking classes are always full and that the home gourmet is alive and well in Montpellier, thanks to the inspiration gained in this room. These women are keeping classic French cuisine alive in their homes and Chef Francis Navarre is a talented teacher. The first dish today is rolled chicken with chestnuts, a mesclun salad with wild mushrooms, and a sherry vinegar and walnut oil vinaigrette. Most of these days we buy ready prepared jus and sauces which are really good quality. But it's absolutely fantastic to make it at home. And he's shown that you can't make a good one without taking time. And he will deglaze it three or four times and then reduce it. Then deglaze it again with a bit of wine. This whole outfit is about flavour. The flattened chicken surrounds a chestnut paste. Chef loves his plastic wrap, the secret to poaching perfectly formed rolls. As the chicken poaches, the ladies turn their attention to quail stuffed with foie gras. Petite morsel served with black trumpet mushrooms and grapes with a soya jus. This truly is food for very grateful guests. Chef tells them they will even have to peel the grapes. So the chicken and quail are poaching, and the next bird part on the menu is duck breast, seared and roasted on the bone, and caramelized with spiced honey, served with grilled pumpkin and eggplant, and a duck jus with figs. I asked if classic French cuisine is in danger of dying out in these modern times. What does the future hold for their children? This sure gets them talking. When I asked them if um, young people still were interested in this kind of food and if, if they were going to keep cooking this kind of food because it's important and they said, no, we think you have quite a negative attitude. We don't think that um, the French are losing this style of cuisine. Young people will go and eat at McDonald's, but if they are given this food and taught it, even if they go through their teenage years, they'll come back to it because they've learned the taste of it. Pardoned by that response, <laughs> And with three fancy recipes in hand, I chalk up a cooking lesson. It's never too late to learn a few more tricks. Uzez, my southern French base, is one of France's treasured art towns. Dating right back to the Roman times, there are traces everywhere of the passing centuries. I've arranged a walking tour to acquaint my gastronomads with its rich and fascinating history. Uzez made much of its wealth from the production of serge fabrics and silk. Stepping into the foyers of some of these buildings, which are now divided into apartments, reveals incredible feats of masonry. 
though the town has been through periods of decline. It was at a particularly roughshod point in the 1960s. But thanks to the Malho law, a lot of money was poured into restoring Uzes in the 1970s, and it's never looked back. Now visitors can enjoy many gorgeous aspects, such as the medieval gardens, tucked in next to the castle. I love the gentle dove grey, green and bolder colours of Uzes. If you wanted to paint your shutters bright blue or hot pink, you wouldn't be allowed. This official edict gives the town a soft cohesiveness, square especially. Now you'll remember my friend Annie from the Uzes Weekly Market in the town square. Gorgeous Annie. Wildly expressive, salt of the earth. Yeah. Makes and sells pelards on goat cheese. Well, her creative process is too good to miss out on. So it's a field trip for my culinary students. Into the countryside to the source of this wonderful regional specialty. Annie's big billy goat and her dear husband Bruno bear a striking resemblance. Be a descent, both of them. Bruno is responsible for milking twice a day, and each dear little nanny goat produces three to six organic litres daily. This is as cute a farm scene as you'll ever get. As an artisan cheesemaker, she is a special breed, rearing her animals, milking and making her own Peladon cheese. Many farmers these days sell their milk to the co-op and it becomes a factory product. But for Annie, it's more about love. And every day she turns them. Ah, yeah, yeah. They produce different amounts of milk at different ages and at different times of the day. And if it's really hot, they, they don't produce milk. Um, if it, the temperature goes down, they produce lots of milk. Also, it's different at different seasons. Spring milk tastes completely different from winter milk. So this is what she would call meat thick, which is half dry. These are fresh. And you eat, you eat them at all the different stages. It just depends why you want to eat it, what you get like this, you can put honey and jam all over, cheese once you put on toast and grills them with face. <laughs> so good. And um, when they're really, really hard like this. Oh my god. Now but a lot of people love this. And it started off that time. And you grate it to all oh. You grate it like well. And while these fresh pillowy cheeses are bound for the next market, we get to indulge in this divine health food over lunch. Down an alleyway in Montpellier's old quartier, I enter a building once inhabited by the famous French botanist Pierre Magnol one of the fathers of plant classification. These days, it houses the studio of Frédéric Chaudière, a man of note within his own field of violin making. Montpellier has become widely known for its luthier, and Frédéric's instruments are owned by some of the world's great musicians. It's a fascinating craft, requiring patience, extreme attention to detail, and the right ingredients. Frederick, how do you start making a violin? What's the first thing you do? The first thing I do is going into the forest to the sawmill, choosing the pieces. Okay, so this is maple, and it comes from uh, Balkan. So this is uh, from Bosnia. Yes. This is where the best maple grows. The maple for these violins is scarce. It comes from trees with a disease which gives the wood its wavy appearance. Frederick spends about a month making each violin, and with the help of an assistant, he turns out about 20 instruments a year, including violas, cellos, and guitars. Make violins, you have to make mistakes first. And then if you make mistakes and uh, you're a good violin maker, you can repair them. Yeah, and, uh, and I guess you don't repeat them. Yes. A little bit like cooking, perhaps. 
except the gratification from the finished product is much more drawn out. How does it make you feel when you're sitting there all on your own for hours and hours doing this tiny, tiny, picky work? When I work with my hands, my brain goes somewhere else. I can work with yeah. my brain on something else. So I can be writing, oh, and I can, really? write, or I can be thinking of uh, something else. Do you need to be a good violinist to make a good violin? Good point. You need to have skills, good ears, and to be able to play. And with a tone besetting a Stradivarius, a completed violin finds its voice. I'm visiting one of Montpellier's cultural treasures, Chateau Flaugerg, built in the late 17th century. It's known as a folie, meaning a house in the foliage. These grand houses stemmed from a new aristocratic order whose wealth came from their service to the king. My host is Comte, as in Count, Pierre de Colbert, a 10th generation descendant of the original family. And to this day, his family still live in the chateau. It's a living, breathing piece of history. Okay. Pierre began giving public tours of his chateau when he was just 15. Pierre, this is the house you were born in, that you grew yes. up in, it's your yes. home. Yes, my as home. Well, as this it's historic a monument. Yeah. It's like a double life. <laughs> Taking pride of place is the grand staircase. Suspended by hanging key vaults, it occupies almost a third of the building. And the ancestors actually look quite a nice bunch. Look at that gorgeous girl. So this picture is my the wedding of my parents. Isn't that wonderful? So this is part also of the house, the, 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 the philosophy. People are visiting a house with paintings. Uh, and family and, and things. And, and it's not dusty and musty and old. No. It's a living treasure with vivant. Uh, people's vivant. hearts still beating yeah. in it. Yeah. Furniture from the era of Louis XV and XVI graced the rooms. I can imagine the evenings spent socialising. There's personal effects from the Napoleonic era when family members went to war. And from the well-worn writing desk presided over by a magnificent Flemish tapestry to a collection of old family books, the home's contents speak of noble lives well lived. So you have every great describe, great yeah. observation, description, and after that, we may see some pictures of them. The Chateau's gardens have been maintained just as authentically. Kumquats, I love kumquats. Can cook the, the duck with the kumquats. Oh, Can I know all of Here, this garden here has had, and the one next door has had many incarnations. Is this how it was right at the beginning, what you've got now? Yes, exactly. In fact, we, we planned it. We recreated because of the, the original drawing. The impeccable classic French garden is flanked by an English-inspired one with a massive collection of exotic plants. This is my favourite place in the whole botanical garden. This is where I had my first wine tasting with Pierre, and we sat here in the middle. And it's, a, it's what's called a bamboo terre, and it's got at least a dozen different varieties of bamboo in here. And it's just so magical and so quiet and wonderful. Another part of the property with its heart still beating is the winery, creating vintages from the last vineyard within the confines of Montpellier City. I'm here just after harvest and the juice is flowing. I love Pierre's winemaking room because it's so old. At these tanks here from the 19th century. So it's almost done. Almost the same price. Um, the production of white is a very small production in, in Pojag, so we can have a, a very good... Um, uh, we're taking very a good care. Of, yeah, a lot yeah, of attention, a lot of, a lot of, yeah. because it's a small tank and it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's one of the treasures in Pojag. And as this being a tour guide and a winemaker weren't enough, this nobleman is also a waiter, along with his wife, the Countess, in the Chateau's Courtyard restaurant. 
a modern count in many ways, including his early adoption, in French terms at least, of screw caps or stelvin lids for his wines. There you go. Get that. Isn't that fantastic? I'm a member of La Confrérie, so Confrérie Bachic, the Chevalier du Padavis, so the Knight of Cuca. He is the Knight of the Screw Cap. So we should really put this on, yes, I think, just so that... This medal that all around my neck. will take you seriously. Yeah. yeah. It's very serious. Yes, okay. Confrérie. Believe me. <laughs> very. Okay. <laughs> It's like Henri de Calbert is quite accustomed to bearing medals around his neck. Even tongue-in-cheek ones. Must have been born to it. So, from the historical highlight to a way of living which has, over the centuries, been based on subsistence. It's important for my culinary students to not only experience fine cuisine, but also food which traditionally sustained the southern French masses. We've seen her goats and cheese making. And now Annie takes center stage in the kitchen. This is the mouche that we're making, a traditional peasant dish of here, which is a pig's uh -huh. stomach stuffed with pork and vegetables and spices. Pork neck is minced together with sweet onions from the Cévennes Mountains, carrots, parsley, and 16 cloves of garlic. There's proportionately very little meat to vegetables, Historically, of course, it was expensive. The peasants couldn't afford meat in great quantities. Annie adds slabs of pork fat, which will fill the mouche out and give it an extra flavor punch. This is the already cooked silver meat. She doesn't measure any of the ingredients, of course. She just throws in what feels right. The ingredients can change too, depending on what's in season. A big handful of thyme. Always use your hands if possible. Don't listen to any of those home ec teachers. Thing. Just makes you realise how much you can fit in your stomach. Yeah. I have to say this is not an everyday peasant dish. It was traditionally made for special occasions only. The stomach's sewn up and wrapped in a tea towel. And then she washes it for days and wrapping it in yeah. Then, like a brown paper package, it's tied up with string. <laughs> Cooking a large thing like this is obviously going to take some time. It's placed in a bain-marie and gently poached at about 85 degrees centigrade for five hours. Slow food to the nth degree. But with hungry guests waiting, Annie magically produces an already cooked mouche. And so to our peasant feast. Nothing wrong with being a person of the land if this meal is anything to go by. And it's finished perfectly with a selection of Annie's divinely fresh goat cheeses coated with her homemade jam. The cheese maker and chef chalks up a success. Join me next time for an episode centered around the bountiful harvest of the Languedoc Roussillon region. It's a time for harvesting snails and cooking lessons with lots of fresh tomatoes. And as we're in France's main grape growing region, it would be criminal not to experience the region's wine culture. <laughs>